SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. So at this time, uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Jennifer Copeland, and she has a most interesting topic for us to uh, cover today, and that is, should we be paying more attention to the weather and biodiversity changes in faraway Antarctica? So please welcome Dr. Copeland. Hello, everyone. How's that? Good? Excellent. Thank you so much for the introduction, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I, there's a few familiar faces, quite a few familiar faces around the room. Anyone who knows me knows that if I can get people to sit down and listen to me talk about Antarctica, I'm in a good mood. So I'm in a very good mood that we're all here together today. So I do have lots of, uh, lots of content today. I'm actually worried about fitting this into half an hour, so I'm... so. Uh, I'm gonna work really hard at it because it's very hard to cut back my pictures and slides and stories because I have so many that I want to tell. So I'll start with telling you why I ended up in Ant Antarctica in the first place. So I'm a professor uh, at the University of Lethbridge um, and in 2020 the pandemic hit and I was working in my basement as everyone was uh, with perhaps a little more time than usual on my hands. And a good colleague and friend pointed out a program for me uh, called Homeward Bound. So Homeward Bound is an international um, leadership initiative specifically targeted towards women in STEM. So science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine. And I'm, I'm trained as a scientist. I'm an exercise scientist. Uh, I feel like I know some of you because you were in research projects in my lab, in my exercise physiology lab at the University of Lethbridge. So I'm a scientist, I'm, but I'm also very interested outside of my own research in sustainability, uh, global change, environment, and I'm interested in leadership. And so this program touched on all of those things. So the goal of Homeward Bound is essentially to create an international cohort of women who have been trained in a very particular uh, sort of style or type of leadership approach that they believe will ultimately result in better outcomes for our planet. So I applied, it was a big lengthy application, 10 pages, and we had to make a video pitch and all these things. And I sent it off and then I didn't hear for the longest time, COVID, right? Everything was just kind of, so I thought, well, that didn't happen. And then finally, about six months later, um, it was, I was told that I was selected as one of 100 women from around the world in the sixth cohort of Homeward Bound. So at that point, they'd had five cohorts. Uh, cohort five, got their trip to Antarctica, you know, halted about two weeks before they left, which is quite devastating. So we had to switch gears a little bit and we did uh, a full year of online programming. So twice a month for a year, I met on Zoom with these 100 wonderful people from all over the world. So there were uh, 29 different countries represented in my cohort. There were, initially there were four of us from Canada and, uh, and so we did a whole lot of online programming together, waiting to hear when we would be able to do our voyage. And so in fall of 2023, uh, finally Antarctica was opening up a bit more, and we embarked on a three-week voyage to Antarctica that included an intensive three-week program uh, on leadership and science um, in Antarctica. So here we are just before we were about to uh, board the trip. So what I want to do today in the 30 minutes that I have your attention is tell you a little bit about uh, what I learned, some science that I learned, uh, some things that I learned about Antarctica, some things that I learned about leadership, and then what I also really want to do is show you lots of pictures of penguins and whales because there were a lot of them and it was a very big highlight of the voyage. So I'll just quickly show you where we traveled to and from. <clears throat> so we, we all met in Argentina. 
Um, and so I spent some time in uh, Buenos Aires, and then I made my way to Porto Madryn, which you can see on the, um, I think that's what this is, which you can see here, uh, where we all met up, and that's where our ship was leaving from. We traveled to the Falkland Islands, uh, which was actually a very interesting. Some of us were like, ah, Falkland Islands, let's just get to Antarctica. But the Falkland Islands were actually more than I would have anticipated. The wildlife, um, the scenery, uh, some of the global change that's happening there was very educational. So it was fascinating. We were directed, we were originally intended to go to South Georgia. Uh, some of us, myself included, were very excited about that. Do I have any? Shackleton fans in the room. Anyone who's read of Shackleton, right. So if you're a Shackleton fan, you're keen on South Georgia. I was very keen to get to South Georgia. Um, not just because it would have been really interesting to see where Shackleton's uh, crew eventually landed, but also because South Georgia is actually a very, very interesting case study in um, in uh, wildlife conservation and preservation and reversing the incredible impacts of humans on wildlife. So at one point, South Georgia was almost devastated by the whaling industry um, and has been now protected and is actually recovering. So it's also a very interesting case study in that way. Nonetheless, after all that, we did not get to go to South Georgia. The avian influenza had already hit the Southern Ocean in November when we were there. And as a collective group that care about the planet, we were able to go. Um, um, but our ship's uh, expedition team and us decided that we did not want to go because we did not want to be the first ones to bring the avian flu to Antarctica, uh, where it had not yet reached. So we very bravely, and I would say, in a, you know, with a sense of true leadership, chose not to go somewhere that we really wanted to go, um, and instead we headed straight to the Antarctic Peninsula. So we made three stops in the Falkland Islands. And then we uh, made our way across the Drake Passage, more on that later, uh, and made our way to the Antarctic Peninsula. And I won't go through all the stops, but you can see here that we visited 10 different places um, in the, on the Antarctic Peninsula. So some of you may be asking, so why Antarctica? Why a global leadership program? Why Antarctica? It is the, uh, so I think in the, brochure for this, it specified the fifth largest continent, which sounds like a really boring claim to fame. I'm the fifth largest continent. But in fact, it has m much more of a claim to fame. It's also the coldest, windiest, highest, driest, and least inhabited uh, of all the continents, which doesn't make it sound very uh, hospitable, um, but does make it very, very interesting. I would like to say that cold, windy, uh, and high and dry, I felt like Lethbridge has been training me well for this. There were other, <laughs> there were other people that were struggling with the climate a lot more than I was. I, was, I felt very well prepared. Um, so, why Antarctica? There's a few reasons why this program has historically centered on Antarctica, although for the record they are not, and if we have time any more going forward, and if we have time at the end, I'll explain that. Um, but part of the reason, and I'm going to touch on some of these, is Antarctica is a very interesting place in terms of common heritage. So nobody owns Antarctica. Uh, there are no national claims to Antarctica. It is a place of, that belongs to all of us and none of us at the same time. So I'm going to say more about that, but it makes it a very interesting uh, place for people that are interested in collaboration, global change, um, and how to protect our planet. Uh, global change, I'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, the environment in Antarctica is changing very rapidly, uh, much more rapidly actually than almost anywhere else on Earth, which makes it a very interesting place to see with your own eyes uh, if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to talk at the end a little bit about connections to place uh, and the premise of the program being focused on being able to connect uh, to yourself with your group and with the place that you're in while simultaneously disconnecting from normal life. I was very far away from home. I was very far away from all of the meetings that I attend at the University of Lethbridge. And so uh, it, was a, it was a real moment to take some time to really think about the kinds of things we were learning about. And also, it's incredibly awe-inspiring, which is another uh, goal of that program. So the title of my talk uh, here today, I want to spend a little bit of time convincing you that even though Antarctica is extremely far away, do I have anyone else in the room that's been to Antarctica? So not too many people, although I'll mention this later as well, uh, 
more and more people are visiting Antarctica, but very few have. And it's very far away. It took me a very long time to get there. Um, several, you know, complete days of travel to actually get there. And so, but it matters. And it actually matters even to us uh, in southern Alberta. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the science that I learned. Although, to be clear, that wasn't the focus of the program. The focus of the program was primarily on leadership. So you didn't have to be an environmental scientist, like I'm not a climate scientist, um, and you didn't have to be to go on this trip. It was a wide, diverse range of scientists on this trip. Um, there were engineers, there were construction engineers, there were physicians, there were physicists, astrophysicists, chemists, um, as well as a lot of people who do study climate and environment. But one thing that we all shared was a passion for sustainability, so that was a very common uh, thread among all of us. And so uh, Antarctica um, has impacts on climate regulation for the whole planet. I'm going to briefly touch on that later. Something you may not know and that I definitely did not know is that the southern ocean, the ocean around Antarctica, the, the currents there, the, um, the uh, ocean currents in Antarctica actually have a huge regulatory influence over ocean currents around the whole world. There's a lot of ice in Antarctica, so Antarctica has great potential to impact sea levels all over the world. Uh, biodiversity I'm going to mention a little bit later. It's home to some very unique creatures uh, that provide opportunities for innovation and research. And finally, I'll talk a little bit about the international collaboration and common heritage of man uh, approach in Antarctica that makes it a really interesting place for scientific research and discovery. So what I said I was going to talk to you about today is what I learned in, about, and from Antarctica. I could, it would actually take me several hours to go through everything that I learned in, about, and from Antarctica. So I've tried to hit the highlights, and I'll keep an eye on my time. So I'm going to talk first a little bit uh, briefly about the size and diversity. I think many of us picture Antarctica a certain way, um, and most of us are wrong, as I learned. Uh, about its impact and importance about biodiversity and importantly I really want to spend a minute talking about the governance structure in, Antarct in Antarctica because I think it's an important model um, for the way we do things uh, in this world. I just want to briefly mention I have a lot of pictures in here. I feel as though this screen is not doing them justice. They are very beautiful. Um, and I've tried very hard to attribute all of them to the, we shared photos at the end, and I have a reasonably nice camera, but Maya Bino, uh, a friend that I met on the voyage from Jordan, had like several huge, amazing cameras. She's essentially a semi-professional photographer, as well as some others. So I tried to attribute photos to others. Well, I did attribute photos to others, except for one that I missed, um, and we'll fix after this. And But if there's no name, it means it's one of my pictures. And some of my best pictures I actually took with my iPhone, so there you go. Um, okay, so size and diversity. So Antarctica is much bigger, uh, certainly, than I realized. This is partly because we all grew up learning from those Mercator uh, maps that are distorted, as some of you may know, uh, that are quite... Uh, you know, Eurocentric, and that all, you know, we all grew up learning that Antarctica is this little white strip at the bottom of the map, um, but it's actually a massive continent. And so just to give you a frame of reference, here's Antarctica relative to North and South America. See, who knew, right? Here it is, uh, sorry, that was North America. Here it is relative to South America. And there it is relative to Africa. So it's an enormous uh, continent. It is also mostly uh, covered with ice, uh, which you may have known, but not completely. And there is this sense, I think, that Antarctica was, is this sort of small swath of ice floating around down in the um, southern ocean. But in fact, it's actually, because it's so much bigger than people realize, it's also much more diverse than people realize, both in terms of the flora and the fauna that do exist there, and in terms of the temperature range. So I visited the Antarctic Peninsula, which is actually where most people visit, in part because it's the easiest part to get to. Um, and you might not be able to see that, but the average annual temperature so uh, on the Antarctic Peninsula is minus five degrees Celsius. That's average. It's obviously colder in the winter, a little bit warmer in the summer. And of course, we were there in November, which was the start of their summer. Um, but really, I mean, when you come from Canada, 
this, these temperatures were not alarming to me at all. I didn't have to buy special gear. I already owned everything they recommended that we buy. Some of the women coming from subtropical regions were panicking about where to buy a down jacket. And I was like, I have three. Um, <laughs> So, but if you also look at places like, so this is the, the kind of place that we're familiar with. So Vostok is the Russian research base. There are many research bases. McMurdo is one of the largest ones, American. Vostok is the Russian uh, base, and it is, uh, has an average annual temperature of minus 55 degrees Celsius, right? So these are the kinds of temperatures people associate with Antarctica, but it's incredibly variable. And so is the wildlife. So as I mentioned, lots of penguin pictures. Those are a daily penguins that stood nicely for me. So Antarctica is actually home to very resilient and unique uh, forms of life that we can learn a lot about. Some of them are adapting well to the really rapidly changing climate. Some are not. Uh, Antarctica, another thing that makes Antarctica really unique is that it was one of the last regions on Earth, um, and notice I said was, was one of the last regions on Earth to remain largely unimpacted by invasive non-native species because it was, was uh, harder for people to get there. But that is changing also very rapidly with the warming and the loss of ice and the increasing visitors. Um, the species in Antarctica are inevitably going to change. So I mentioned I wanted to talk a briefly about the governance system. So Antarctica, as I mentioned, is owned by no one. Um, and this, it was established through the Antarctic Treaty, in, which was signed in 1959 by, I forget exactly how many countries initially, and more have signed on since. And everyone agreed that Antarctica would remain an unowned by any country or nation continent that was dedicated specifically as a natural reserve devoted to peace, science, and collaboration. And so far, that has been working quite effectively. If you start reading the history, you'll you slowly realize that humans, we are a predictable bunch. And so there have been, you know, various attempts, you know, countries sending pregnant women over to have a baby there to try to like lay, lay claim. Um, yes, that did happen. Two countries have done that. Um, but generally speaking, it's still working that everyone agrees Antarctica belongs to all of us. The other thing I wanted to mention is IATO. So IATO is the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators, which was established in 1991 specifically to um, promote Antarctic tourism while protecting the continent at the same time. So it's a voluntary program. If you do ever want to go to Antarctica, I, it's very important in my opinion that you make sure that the tour operator you want to go with is a member of IATO. Uh, most of them are. Um, and so this is a voluntary program where they all agree uh, to a variety of critical protocols that will help preserve the environment down there. So protecting wildlife, uh, respecting protected areas, respecting scientific research, keeping it pristine. And there are very strict uh, landing and transport requirements that make traveling in Antarctica quite an adventure because you can never have more than one ship at a landing at a time, which is very nice for traveling. You're not going to be crowded there with a zillion ships. But it make, means that things have to change on a dime. As the weather changes, if you can't make it to your spot, you can give it up to another ship that's closer by and then change your plans. And so our plans throughout the three weeks were constantly changing. We got to, we missed places that we really wanted to go. Elephant Island Island we were supposed to go to, back to the Shackleton fans. I was really excited to go to Elephant Island. Didn't make it, bad weather. Um, Coverville Island was an amazing stop that we ha had not originally scheduled that came open because someone else couldn't make it. So it's very complicated, um, but it shows again that people can work together uh, for the good of a place. Biosecurity is another very important part of the IATO protocols, back to that trying to avoid having invasive species reach Antarctica. We had to, we were given strict instructions about cleaning all our gear before we went. So this is me cleaning all my shoes in the bathtub before I left. Um, but even with that, uh, every time we exited or um, entered the ship from landings, we had issued boots from the ship that had to be sterilized through three different chemicals and wiped um, every time we came on or off the ship. So very strict protocols trying to avoid those invasive species uh, reaching Antarctica. So those are some of the things I learned about the size, diversity, uh, impact, and governance. 
Now I'll talk a little bit all about wildlife, which is for sure a highlight of visiting this place, uh, about the changing climate, science and leadership, and I'll wrap up with connection to place. So first, just a few cute penguin pictures. So just so you know, penguins are every bit as good as they're cracked up to be. They were amazing. So some of these are actually from the Falkland Islands. When you see pictures with no ice, that was Falkland Islands. So these were rockhopper penguins as well as uh, black-browed albatrosses. There were many um, amazing birds in the Southern Ocean region. Uh, we also saw king penguins, and those are, that's a king penguin chick. They were absolutely adorable. As we walked down onto that beach, I said to, I said, what are those brown things? I had no idea, and they said, those are the chicks. And I, to be fair, did anyone know the chicks would be as big as the penguins? But um, they were. Um, just a quick picture of some king penguin. Oh no, it flipped. That didn't work, okay. It's a really cute video of penguins walking. <laughs> that did not work well, technical difficulties. Um, we watched them feeding, uh, the moms feeding the chicks, and we also saw some of the chicks beginning to molt uh, and get their wet weather feathers ready. Uh, we also saw Magellanic penguins there, so I saw six species in total, I think I've now covered four. We weren't always just working, walking around looking at wildlife though, we were working. We had full day workshops almost every day. Sometimes whenever possible we would workshop outside when the weather was good. As we got closer to Antarctica, that was no longer an option. Um, but this was still in the Falkland Islands. So we left the Falkland Islands and we crossed the Drake Passage, uh, which if you may or may not know are uh, infamous for being the roughest seas in the world. So there are very good um, reasons why the seas are very rough here. Very briefly, the ocean in this region has no land mass buffering it. And so the currents and the circumpolar winds really whip up a lot of waves. So it's quite infamous for being um, very terrible. It can be calm and it can be good. They call it the Drake Shake and occasionally you get the Drake Lake. I definitely got the Drake uh, Shake on the way over and I have a video but now I'm worried it's going to flip and not illustrate the point very well. Yeah, so sorry about that but that is a good video demonstrating um, and you can hear that we were screaming. <laughs> So sorry about that, that video is not working very well. But uh, we had a very rough ride over. Um, there was lots of medication involved in that <laughs> voyage. But it was worth it because when we, we got through the night, the afternoon and the night, that was nighttime, that picture. We also had about 16 hours of daylight down there at this time. Uh, and when we woke up the next day, these were the kinds of sights we saw. We were in Antarctica. Uh, so that was one of my favorite icebergs. The light was beautiful and stunning and amazing. And it was truly quite awe-inspiring to be there. That was the, one of the largest icebergs we saw. It was over 300 meters long. And this is when we, we were doing landings. We would always leave the ship in a little zodiac, uh, in little teams. Uh, so although I said it wasn't terribly cold there, uh, it was still pretty cold on a Zodiac, so we were pretty bundled up for these kinds of trips. And when we would do landings, uh, we would see the most amazing scenery. That's a chinstrap penguin, a very cute penguin that we saw lots of as well. The wildlife uh, will get very close to you there. So we had instructions about staying uh, five meters from all wildlife and particularly the penguins. And it was actually hard work. I have a video at the end if we have time, but it was actually hard work. Um, so I'm gonna skip that video since those aren't working. This one might work. This was a whale. Yeah, the whales were amazing. Uh, lots of whales, fin whales, humpback whales, and also seals. Uh, we saw Weddell seals, elephant seals. They were extremely cute. And again, we had an opportunity to talk a lot about science. So we visited Palmer Station. This is a U.S. research base. 
And we also had an expedition team on board, uh, and we had quite an all-star cast in ours. So this is Mark Brandon. He's a polar scientist from the UK. He recently won the Polar Medal, which is a very prestigious research award. And he has been, if any of you are familiar with BBC Frozen Planet and Blue Planet, he is a scientific lead on the development of those programs. So he's quite famous. Oh yeah, I'm nowhere near five minutes, so I gotta hurry up. So we learned a lot from Mark. It was very exciting to learn important things from one of the key uh, polar researchers. So one of the things we learned about was um, about the changing climate and the possible impacts of it on the rest of the world, which are some of the key points I wanted to make to you today. So the Southern Ocean is actually one of the biggest carbon and heat sinks on this planet. So 90% of excess heat that's been produced by humans so far has been absorbed by oceans, and three quarters of that specifically in the Southern Ocean. So the Southern Ocean is absorbing a lot of heat uh, and a lot of carbon. As it warms, uh, it's gonna threaten to change those uh, global ocean circulations that I mentioned, and it's gonna potentially impact weather events and ocean currents around the entire planet. I also mentioned the, if the entire Antarctic ice sheet, so it's 14 million square kilometers, and at its peak um, on the Antarctic plateau, it's four kilometers thick. So that is a lot of ice. If it were to melt all at once, it would raise global sea levels by more than 55 meters. So I mean, this would change the entire world as we know it. Now, clearly, the entire Antarctic ice shelf, uh, ice, shelf is, uh, ice um, sheet is not going to melt all at once. So that's not to suggest that that's going to happen, but it is already starting to melt, and it's behaving in ways that are a bit unpredictable. So much of what we learned from Mark was about all of the research and modeling that is going on, trying to predict what is gonna happen. And so one of the key points that I wanna make is us understanding this faraway place and what's happening there is actually really critical, even to us in Southern Alberta, because it is going to have global impacts. We think of the planet as very large, but it is actually all just one ecosystem. So just a quick graph to show you some data to show how strangely things are behaving in Antarctica in the last year, few years in particular. So the ice, this is um, sea ice, which is actually less concerning for sea rise because it's already in the sea, right? It's the, when the land ice melts that could really have a huge impact on sea levels. These aren't necessarily gonna impact sea levels, but they are impacting the temperature of the water and the currents and how many icebergs there are. And of course, sea ice is always incredibly variable, and these are um, extent departures from a normative baseline. So this is just meant to show you how variable, and you can't really see here, but these all each of these lines represents a year. And you can see that it's always, you know, since uh, these data go back to 1979, it's always been very variable, but things are changing in a scope that we've never seen before. So uh, one of the things that's a little scary is when you talk to the scientists, they're telling you that things are um, changing in ways that even they didn't expect to see this soon. So the impact, so Mark gave us a lot of data and presentations on what Antarctica will look like under a 1.5 degree Celsius warming scenario. And I was gonna go through this, but I'll just, um, that's a blue-eyed shag, another lovely bird that we saw a lot of. So some of the things that Mark told us were um, under 1.5 degrees Celsius, so that was the Paris Agreement, right, was to try to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, under that scenario, the Antarctic Peninsula would have up to 130 days each year above zero. Uh, significantly more ocean turbulence, which is gonna impact global weather patterns. Uh, the thinning and receding glaciers is gonna impact both sea level rise and potentially impact global shipping and supply chains because of the way these icebergs are being released from this continent. Uh, significant changes in what biological organisms can survive in the region, where they can live, this is gonna impact global food webs. One of the things that was very interesting though is that Mark told us that non-native species are a greater threat to the biodiversity of Antarctica than actual warming under a 1.5 degree Celsius scenario. The unfortunate thing about all this is that at this point we already know with certainty that we're going to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius warming. So um, all that modeling and years that they spent working on the 1.5 degrees Celsius scenario, they now know they need to look at two degrees Celsius, 2.5 degrees Celsius scenarios and start to try to make predictions. Um, so there's still a lot to learn about what's gonna happen down there and what this is gonna look like for us. 
Some of the species are very resilient. These, this is a Gen 2 penguin. We saw lots of them. They are adapting well to climate change. They're finding new places to nest, um, and they seem to be adapting well. Other penguin species are not faring well at all. So there's also things to be learned about how different species uh, can adapt, and hopefully things that we can all learn from that. They are very adaptable. I'm sure when I play this, it will, um, they're also very brave. Sometimes they would just fall off the ice as we were watching them. Um, so in my one, two minutes left, I'll talk just briefly about the leadership program. Um, and so we, as I said, we did a lot of workshopping and we'd also worked online together for a whole year prior to uh, meeting each other. And the, the Homeward Bound program really focuses on what they call a different style of leadership. Um, they say, and I think we could agree, that current leadership models are not working so well if you look at the way things are going for our planet. And so better outcomes for the planet require a more values-based and legacy-minded approach to leadership, a more collaborative style, uh, and there was a strong emphasis on finding our voice and visibility as women uh, to lead in this constructive and collaborative way. There was also a strong emphasis on leading in emergence, and I don't have time to get into that too much, but the concept there is that uh, when you're trying to lead in very complex situations, uh, which is a lot of what's facing the world, it does take a different approach. And leading in emergence really emphasizes that leadership emerges in complex situations from networks and groups of people, not from the behaviors of one single leader, manager, or person. And so these were all lessons that really resonated with me, um, and it was a really exciting program to participate in. I was gonna talk about the ship crew and leadership, which I won't, but feel free to ask me about that. So I'm going to, I can see my moderator standing, so I'm going to end with my last point. Um, my takeaway point, so I mentioned at the start about connecting to place. So this image here is a picture I took uh, from the Gerlache Strait. This was our first full night in, in Antarctica. The light was mesmerizing. We were surrounded by icebergs. The ship was moving very slowly and quietly because there were whales in the area. It was possibly the most beautiful thing uh, I've ever seen. I still get choked up when I talk about it. Um, and that connection to that place is what gives people um, the desire and the tenacity to want to protect it. And so this was a big emphasis of the program, but I think the last point that I want to make is that I have actually felt very similar feelings when I was in our own beautiful Rocky Mountains and when I was in our own beautiful Coulees and River Valley in Lethbridge, Alberta. And so uh, I think the more all of us can connect to the place and the natural environment that we are in or have a chance to go to, the more we will understand how important it is that we protect it and that we collaborate and work together uh, to do that. So that would be my final point. Um, I'm going to leave this quote from uh, David Attenborough on the screen as my concluding slide, but feel free to ask me about it because I have some things I'd like to say about it. Thank you. Okay, just stay right there. Okay, so Q&A, line up along there where Knud is. Keep your comments short and your question to the point. Once you've asked your, and also state your name, of course, and then uh, return to your seat. So those are clear instructions, right? All righty. Okay, who's first? Here she comes. Leona Jacobs. Okay, I'll bite. What's this about? The quote. <laughs> Why, thank you for giving me additional time for my presentation. So, um, so Mark uh, Brandon, who I mentioned, of course, worked closely with uh, David Attenborough on all of his um, Frozen Planet BBC shows. And so this is a quote that is often, you know, I think used, um, I think we used it as a way to justify our presence in this place that I do want to tell you I very profoundly regularly felt like I should not be there. 
Um, and so, but one of the things that they say is that you have to sort of experience a, a place and care about it in order to protect it. And I've thought about that quote actually a lot, um, and it makes it a nice way for me to justify traveling to places. But, but I, I guess I would say two things about that. One, I'm not actually convinced that's true. I actually think it's entirely possible to care about people and places that you've been, or that you haven't been, uh, and still want to protect them. And so I hope that in the time I've had with you today, I've convinced you why Antarctica matters and why the things that we do here impa impact Antarctica and why the things that happen in Antarctica impact us. Uh, I also really want to emphasize the point that we have plenty of beautiful, wonderful places in Alberta that we can experience um, and that hopefully will motivate all of us to care about. So I think there's just a bit of tension in that quote and I was gonna speak a little bit to that and, um, and that I think about it a lot and I'm not sure I have a clear answer. My name is uh, Knut Peterson. Thanks very much uh, for coming and telling us about your trip. Uh, as a former farmer, I'm just wondering if there's any farming happening at the, <laughs> at the Antarctica. Is there any green spaces? So no, uh, no farming. So it is interesting though about green spaces. So I'll, so. There is some green coming that's never been there before, but it's mosses. Well, first of all, I, I, I want to I wanna thank you Sorry for the that. opportunity to ask you that question. <laughs> <laughs> you all saw that. that, was, that was <laughs> so um, so there, were, there was a particular spot on the Shetland Islands as we were leaving, which is considered part of Antarctica, but it's kind of everyone's last stop. Um, and as we were standing there with some of those scientists that I showed you on our expedition team who have done work there for years and years, and I was looking over at a, and I thought, it's so green over there. There's so much moss on that cliff. And they said, I've never seen it that green. Um, so as the ice is receding and as the ground is warming, there are uh, plant life growing there that is, you know, never, so extensively before. Um, certainly in no way is it fertile land for farming and um, although I showed you that research base you know that is you know fairly well developed um, I mean this is a very isolated and remote place even still even with the increasing visitors and increasing science. Um, I mean once you leave a research base you're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, there's not a lot around. A quick point about that this is another very important thing about that IATO group that I mentioned I asked them some questions about that, like how do you get people to cooperate and follow the rules and play along? And, and they said, well, you know, sometimes there are skirmishes. Humans are, as I said, we're a predictable bunch. And so sometimes there are, like, no, I had that site booked. No, I want that site. But they told me, um, our expedition lead, Claudia, told me that for the most part, people really play by the rules because if you get into any kind of trouble there, uh, any kind of trouble. There is no help. You really can only rely on other ships to come and help you. And so everyone really wants to get along um, because they might need each other. And I also thought that was a really fascinating metaphor for humankind on this planet, right? We really do all need each other uh, and so it would make sense to get along. <laughs> Klaus Jericho, thank you for the wonderful description of that huge place and uh, lucky you yeah. to have had this opportunity. Um, that relates to the big word leadership. Mm -hmm. I, I was curious to hear that most of your colleagues were females. Mm -hmm. Now I find that interesting that we've come that far to recognize that females are something special. Mm -hmm. Now, how does this relate, your experience and your leadership, how does this relate to our responsibility to our, to our Arctic? To? To our Arctic. Oh, yeah. Oh, mm. oh yeah. Oh, to our Arctic. Yeah, so I didn't talk a lot about our Arctic. Uh, I'm going to come back to that point. But I will speak briefly to your first point. So 
It wasn't an interesting and amazing experience. The premise of the whole program, uh, and I was assuming someone might ask, why is it focused on women? Um, and there are a few reasons, um, some of which may be considered controversial, but that's okay, I'll say them anyway. I mean, part of it is because we actually have, I'm a scientist and I like data, and we have lots of data that tells us very clearly that when you get, as the higher up you get in terms of leadership positions, the proportion of women gets lower and lower and lower. So historically, women have not held high leadership positions across almost every sector that you can name. And Homeward Bound's goal is to change that. And so what they really wanted to do was create this cohort of women who've had this training. I emphasize that point about finding your voice and your visibility. That's a big focus of the program, is encouraging women to be confident and willing to stand up uh, and take opportunities when they arise and lead in emergence when the moment presents itself. So it was a very interesting and um, exciting part of the program. And um, your other point was the Arctic. So I didn't really talk a lot about our Arctic, which is very interesting when you think about it. But unfortunately, it's actually not a very cheerful story. Um, uh, so first of all, there's no can no real Canadian presence in Antarctica. I checked because I liked it so much. I thought I'm going to go work on one of these Canadian research bases. There are none, which sort of makes sense. We primarily focus on the Arctic. Um, they are incredibly different places. M many of the polar researchers I had a chance to talk with have worked in both, and of course I knew that. But still, it's interesting to hear from scientists. So right, Antarctica is a landmass in the ocean. The Arctic is an ocean with some land kicking around in it. Like they're very very different. Um, the Arctic ice loss has already, you know, it's pretty much gone. Uh, like it is really declining very rapidly in um, in the Arctic compared to the Antarctic. Uh, another interesting thing they told me that was very different about working in the two places was there's only one of those locations where you need to work with a shotgun. <laughs> that was very interesting. There are no bears or large polar bears or large mammals in Antarctic the way there are in the Arctic. So it's a very different approach to doing science too because there are fewer. It's more remote perhaps, but fewer safety concerns from that perspective. Um, but yeah, so the premise of Homeward Bound is that this different approach to leadership, this more collaborative um, type of legacy-minded, uh, values-based approach is what we will, uh, will achieve better outcomes for both the Arctic and the Antarctic. The, the Evidence suggests that women are more prone to that style of leadership uh, than men, and so that is the focus of the Homer Bound program, is to develop those skills and abilities in a large cohort of women scientists around the world. Hi. Hi. Bev Mundell atherstone Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was uh, absolutely fabulous. Now, I'd like to know, since you're talking about this Homeward Bound program and what you learned in the cohort um, being involved with each other for over a year and then going to the Antarctic and uh, finding out and doing research and so on, um, what will continue on? You talk about the cadre of women scientists. Uh, is there funding to support women going into these positions uh, to, to, uh, of leadership for legacy and for changing, um, changing the views of governments and international organizations about what's happening? Um, we already heard last year that we've reached 1.5. Um, the 1.5 mark. So um, w what tangible things are outcomes from this that you might be part of or others will be part of? Thank you. Mm. Great question. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so 1.5, um, just to be clear, we reached it for a good portion of last year. Uh, so we haven't reached it as the overall yet, but it's, it's inevitable at this point. It's locked in is what we learned. Um, at this point. Um, and so the, the Homeward Bound is a not-for-profit organization. We did have to fund all of our own voyages. Um, some, you know, some people fundraised and had sponsors and these kinds of things. Um, COVID was really helpful for saving money. I couldn't go anywhere, so uh, that was uh, helpful uh, in terms of preparing for the trip. So it's a not-for-profit, but 
Definitely the goal isn't that we all walk off the ship and everything ends. The, the network is actually a big part of it. So they're now switched gears to aim for 10,000 women. Originally it was 1,000, 10 cohorts of 100 women. I was in the sixth cohort. Uh, they are already currently recruiting for cohort nine. So they're almost there, but now they've set their sights higher to make it a much bigger cohort. And the idea is that by, um, by building a cohort of people of women around the world who share this passion and share this vision and who've had this same experience or s something like it, um, that those networks will allow the kind of advocacy that you mentioned, I can't, hi. <laughs> so the kind of advocacy work, right, encouraging um, each other, encour you know, working together on um, promoting more women in leadership positions. You know, I've already seen the network collaborating on a variety of projects. Um, I'm working with two different groups out of it. So one of, one of us, we're actually working on a carbon offset project. We want to offset the carbon of our entire trip, including all of our flights. So that's just getting underway. We're at the calculation stage right now. Um, but looking at different projects to help us offset that. I'm also working um, with another group of women from all over the world. We have a meeting next week. And we're working and brainstorming ideas that we can collaborate on around the world that would help generate that connection to place that I mentioned. Because we are all people who got together because we're convinced that if we could get everyone to feel those things when they're outside and spend more time in those environments that people would care more um, uh, when they're engaging in their own daily behaviors, when they're voting, uh, you know, the kinds of things that we can impact. And so there are lots of ongoing projects happening with cohorts, um, different people from the cohorts all over the world. So, which is the goal, was that it would be an ongoing collaboration. Hi, Val Allen. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if you think that we can reach even the 2% um, goal and have a sustainable planet without having a sustainable population level, which most experts believe is around 2 to 3 billion. We're now at 8 billion, and yet population isn't even discussed at climate change conferences. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so one thing, um, in my 30 minutes, I forgot a few key points. So the first very important point that I want to emphasize again is that I am not a climate scientist. Um, so I do not have a lot of expertise in climate scientist. I am a dabbler now who learned a lot of things on a trip, but I'm an exercise scientist. So I do, as a scientist, I really care about expertise and credentials. So I'm not going to say a lot of things about things that I'm not trained in. Um, but I do have a lot of opinions um, and a little bit of knowledge as you saw. So the two degrees Celsius warming uh, limit that you asked for, that you asked about, um, you know, I think a lot of people are starting to redo their modeling. We learned a lot about the modeling that has to happen um, in order to make these predictions, as you also saw. Unfortunately, it is what it is. It's not always predictable. Sometimes there's just these anomalies that we can't explain, and that does seem to be happening a lot more in the Southern Ocean in particular. Um, you may have seen news stories of very unexpected heat waves. There was a big heat wave in Antarctica in 2023, which is partly that sea ice graph that I showed you that no one saw coming. So there's a lot of unpredictability in the modeling, and I think there is um, you know, a lot of modeling that needs to happen. The population thing, I'm not going to touch that too much. The reason no one touches it is because it's incredibly controversial, as you might imagine, and there's all kinds of layers to that. I will say that the one thing that uh, from my own reading and my own personal opinion is that I don't really want to tackle population, I want to tackle education. Uh, we have data that clearly demonstrates that when people have an opportunity for education, um, more sustainable population is a resu direct result, directly results from that. So that's all I'm going to say about that. I focus much more on education for women and girls than I do on population control. Um, and then the other thing I do want to say is that Mark, who, as I said, has been studying that region for 25 years and you know won the polar medal recently, um, ha made it very clear that he is an optimist, that he is optimistic about this. He wants the, you know, he's very passionate about the science and the work that needs to be done. Um, but he is optimistic that the adaptation and the mitigation can can happen uh, if we, A, start really, I mean really, 20 years ago would have been better, but now we'll do, right, in terms of paying attention to these things, um, and if we work together 
and get that kind of global collaboration that we need. So, uh, and he also said that just about every polar scientist that he works with when pushed would tell you that they are optimistic. That was actually kind of heartening because it's easy to get very doom and gloom about this. And so I thought, okay, well, people that really study these things say there's reasons for optimism as long as we dig in uh, and start working on strategies now. I think that's a good message. My name is uh, Graham Greenlee. Generally speaking, the farther south you go on the planet, the warmer it gets. The south, the south Pole is about as far south, of, south of, as you can get. So why is it so cold there? <laughs> well, it's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? What's up and what's down? Somewhere along the way, someone decided, a human decided that north is up and south is down. You tip that thing around and it'll all make sense. So I'm not a geographer either, but thank you for the question. But it's very cold at the South Pole. I would actually really like to overwinter there. I've read a lot of books about Antarctica now. And the polar night where they have the extended period without a single peak of the sun actually sounds very interesting to me. Hi, Jennifer. I'm Henning Budl. You mentioned about the c collaboration and the studies that show that uh, there's a better hope of getting collaboration by having more women involved. You mentioned, you made reference to being scientists. A number of us here in the audience are former scientists mostly. No, I'm uh, always a scientist. And yeah. But uh, the question I want to ask is. This Homeward Bound is an Australian initiated uh, scheme, project, but is there some kind of a tie-in or a plan in the future that you'll have similar Homeward Bound uh, training sessions, uh, in immersions for potential politicians? Because the scientists only can do so much, and then it's up to politicians now all female politicians aren't necessarily collaborative. You mentioned the Falkland Islands, just think of Maggie Thatcher. Yeah, 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 anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. No, there's always lots of, uh, lots of exceptions to any rule, of course. Uh, absolutely. Um, so no, uh, so first of all, I don't want to speak too much. So the Homeward Bound is, a, is its own organization. There are some changes afoot. Uh, I do not believe that educating politicians is one of them. First of all, you'd have to get them to sign up. Um, so there's that. So I, no, I think that you're right. I mean, I, your point is well taken. Um, but many of the um, women that were part of this voyage have, you know, lots of them had uh, roles in NGOs and in government, uh, you know, places. So beyond just politicians, there are ways to affect change as scientists in, in a variety of different roles. And part of the diversity of what everyone was doing is actually part of the strength, I think. It wasn't just a group of polar researchers who do all, you know, it was, it was widespread, the kinds of areas that people worked. Um, you know, be it in conservation, in advanced education, there's lots of us that work at universities and play a role in shaping education and curriculum and so those kinds of, there's all kinds of ways in which I think you can have an impact. Um, a program like this for politicians would be amazing, but I don't know who's going to fund that exactly. Um, and now I'm forgetting what the rest of your question was. I apologize. There was another part to it. Oh, I was going to mention some of the changes um, going forward with Homeward Bound. So um, it is Australia-based, um, but they are working at becoming more uh, global. Obviously, there were, as I said, 29 countries represented in my cohort, um, and they're working very hard to expand that. There were a lot of Australians uh, in my cohort, uh, which makes sense. Um, it's also a little easier for them to get to. They're already down there, right? Uh, or down that way. But um, they are no longer going to be going to Antarctica as part of the program. They're still looking at different kinds of global or regional meetups for the cohorts to have that same immersive experience. There's a few reasons. One relates to the kinds of things we've talked about. It's, it's hard to care that much about having an impact on a place and then s spend a lot of time sending people to a place that you know you're impacting. So that was part of it. The other thing is that the cost, I mean, it's very exp it was very expensive. Um, and that's a real barrier, right? You're really getting a very certain privileged uh, kind 
find a person participating in a program like that. And if you really want to open this up uh, to, you know, a wider swath of women from around the world, then it has to become, you know, more affordable. And so um, that's the other reason why they're no longer choosing Antarctica as their destination. Then, so they're going to focus a bit more on regional. There are so many beautiful places in the world where you can have an immersive experience. Um, now, that's easy for me to say. I got to go to Antarctica, but I still think an immersive experience in our beautiful Rocky Mountains could have a very powerful impact, just as one example. So, Good afternoon. My name is Justin Ellis, and would you please expand further on two topics you mentioned during your talk? Please tell us more about what explicit leadership is and emergent, emergent leadership is. And please tell us more about who Shackleton was. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, those things go well together, actually, because I emergent lead, it's emergent leadership is the concept, um, which is definitely not a term that existed when Shackleton was kicking around. Um, but at the same time, Shackleton's journey definitely required emergent leadership. Um, so the, pre the overall premise of, of leading an emergence, so on the ship, remember we'd only ever met online, um, and as the program progressed, um, they uh, suddenly said, okay, we're opening this up. What sessions, what things do you want to talk about? And different people took over parts of the day and so sort of stepped up and became session leaders. Um, and that required more than just, you know, the four or five faculty who were in designated leadership positions. This required, you know, everyone to step up in a complex situation and lead. And so th that is sort of the overall premise of leading an emergence, right? Is you're in a complex situation, you cannot predict, you know, what tomorrow will bring. And what you need is that collaboration and everyone suddenly, who maybe that wasn't there as your designated leader or manager, but suddenly Suddenly, now they are. So that's a brief um, overview of that. Uh, and so Shackleton, Ernest Shackleton, was uh, a polar, one of the f original famous polar explorers. And he had been to Antarctica, um, but he specifically on this ship, uh, on this voyage in a ship called the Endurance, uh, he was headed off with a crew to everyone in those days. Um, if you start reading about the polar explorers, it's actually fascinating stuff. And everyone wanted to be the first to do something, right? The first to touch Antarctica, the first to cross it on foot, the first to cross it unsupported the first to, you know, sail around it, you name it. And so uh, his was the Trans-Antarctic Expedition. So they set out in a huge wooden ship with a crew and they were heading, um, this was right around First World War time, and they were heading and they wanted the Trans-Antarctic Expedition. They were going to be the first to cross on foot. So they were headed to like the Weddell Sea, I need my map, and then they were going to trek across and someone was picking them up on the other side. They never made it uh, because the ship became encased uh, in ice in a, in a completely anomalous year of sea ice. The ship became trapped. And as I mentioned, even now it's hard to get help in Antarctica. It was pretty much impossible back then. No one even knew where they were. So they survived um, first for a long time on the ship, just wedged in the ice, but eventually the ice crushed the ship and the ship sank. And so they actually lived on an ice flow for an extended period of time. They kept their little life-saving boats. I'm talking quick. They kept their little life-saving boats. Anyway, they had this astonishing uh, journey where they actually overwintered Antarctica without shelter. Um, they made it to Elephant Island. Ultimately, they did. It's a very long story, but after, and they ate seals, and they ate penguins, and they, yeah, it's quite a dramatic story. But eventually, the crew got to Elephant Island, so they actually touched land finally. And then th three of them, including Shackleton, as their leader, headed out in essentially a really fancy rowboat to go across the Drake Passage for help. Now, you saw the Drake Passage, and that was on a big ship. Um, it's, it's the most miraculous story when you read it. So they made it to South Georgia. Quickly, they made it to the wrong side of South Georgia, and they then had to, in whatever gear they have now have left on them from overwintering you know, on an ice floe, they had to hike over the mountain range on South Georgia to get to the whaling stations on the other side. They did, they found help at a whaling station, it then took them another six months to get help back to Elephant Island to pick up the rest of the men. 
Now, like I'm just, I should have told you to read the book. I've just spoiled the whole story, but they all survive. And it's an amazing story. 